Recently, Marnie has developed a completely new look for the brand, pulling in new interest that has been reserved for other more high-profile companies. But Marnie has been going a long time, so why is it only now that they're seeing this kind of attention? Marnie actually originated as a diffusion line of a prolific furrier known as Siwi Furs that began over 70 years ago. Founded in 1950, Siwi Furs was an extremely successful family-run fur company working with mega brands like Fendi, Prada, Jill Sander, Valentino, Dior, Roberto Cavalli, Louis Vuitton, even as recently as 2005. Though CB Furs' website no longer works, I do think they are still around, just now the company is very quiet since fur fell out of favour. To skip forward to the CB Furs timeline that involves Marnie, in the 1990s, CB Furs was run by a man within the family, Jean Castiglione, who was married to Consuelo Castiglione, who was at the time a consultant for the brand. When Consuelo returned to the company in 1994, after taking some time off to bear her two children, she was asked to start a new diffusion line for the company named Marnie after her sister. Marnie was meant to be a much more playful label that extended the company's product offering, this time comprising of what they were considering to be a more ethical acquisition of fur, being that all the fur used by Marnie was a byproduct of the food industry, similar to how cow leather is still procured for many bags, wallets, and shoes today. Marnie slash seaweed furs even went as far as to say it was better environmentally than the synthetic furs that were the alternative at the time, using that as their differentiator. So, Money began with this collection as a one-off product offering, mostly due to how difficult it was to get this so-called ethical fur. However, due to the extreme success of the first collection, which made $26 million, 20% of which was coming from America, that meant that Money would quickly introduce other fabric garments to bulk out their product offering, and again, due to the success of that, footwear was added in 1998 in the spring-summer 1999 collection by way of the ugly clog, as dubbed by Vogue. So, until this point, fur had been quite a large part of the brand offering. But Consuelo was looking to differentiate her brand from the colossally-sized family-run furrier and hadn't used their original key signature of fur in a couple of seasons, so in 1999, the label vowed to drop their fur offering altogether, almost 20 years before other brands like Gucci, Prada would do the same, and broke into their own, becoming their own standalone business. This was actually quite daring. Obviously, fur is widely hated now, but in 1999, the market was absolutely massive, and in the following years since the brand swore off fur, the industry as a whole saw a boom in popularity equal to a 70% increase in global sales between 2000 and 2010. However, that did not mean that in their next collection, Spring Summer 2000, the brand didn't see enormous success. It was met to rave reviews due to its easy-to-wear and colourful offering that was heavily likened to Prada, though with a luxe hippie twist. Of course, the brand had a lot of funding, a lot of success, and a lot of time to define a brand aesthetic, but it's still impressive that key elements like this neckline, playful prints, bold colours, embellished necklines, and this kind of a jacket, which was technically used in the Spring Summer 99 collection before the brand went solo, are already established in this collection. The brand was extremely commercially successful as well, managing to open a store on Sloan Street in London in 2000 and launching Marnie Japan just two years after their separation from Siwi Furs. They used this newly found commercial success to pioneer online retail as well, being one of the first brands to adopt an online store in 2006. So Marnie as a standalone business knew what they were doing. They had a successful aesthetic and brand identifiers right off the bat, as well as an already loyal customer base. However, in terms of creative fashion offerings, Marnie honestly isn't that interesting to analyze from this period in particular. They stuck to their image season after season until adding a standalone menswear line in spring summer 07. This eight outfit collection reads very much as if the brand was testing the waters for menswear. They were solidified as a fashion insider favorite by this point in women's wear, which played into the quiet luxury trend that was going on at the time. But because of this, Marnie didn't have the same brand exposure that their competitors had. But of course, that comes with the negatives that if they do launch a new product line, they cannot guarantee that it will have the same level of demand. So producing an eight outfit collection is definitely smart to test the menswear waters. But I don't know if any of the pieces that they chose were too clever. 
They didn't push menswear in any way. They didn't really even look like something the Lux Hippie brand would create, really. Marnie actually showed menswear in a Spring Summer 02 collection much more successfully for this reason, in my opinion. But perhaps the sales weren't as they expected, so instead, upon the full release of a menswear collection, they produced just the inoffensive, standard menswear pieces that you could have bought in any store, really. But it clearly worked for them. They continued to show two collections per year for menswear in this very mild aesthetic for many years, alongside the ever-growing women's wear offering. And as I stated in my Mew Mew video, it was already outselling Mew Mew, so clearly it was very financially successful for menswear as well. Marnie was growing to be a very respected brand within the industry, slowly growing their already large business over the years, always to good reviews and good sales, including their infamous collaboration with H&M in 2012 during the H&M luxury collab era even managing to sell 61% of the brand to OTB Fashion Group, but they weren't particularly exciting in terms of their retail offering. Though the quality is immaculate, the collections are very similar one after the other. And realistically, though this is speculative, I think the growth of the brand must have just stagnated, leading them to think that it was time to reevaluate where the business was going. I think this specifically because Consuelo decided it was then time to sell the rest of her business, selling the remaining 39% to OTB in 2015, though she did stay on as the head designer. The brand diversified their product offering from here quickly, with the now cult Marni Market debuting in Italy as a fruit market, though it has gone on to be a more full lifestyle brand today, almost like a diffusion line, but not. In regards to Consuela, from here she got much more liberal with her creative style, most notably in Spring Summer 16, which was really the first time the brand had experimented so heavily with their look, and it is still my favourite collection under Consuela. But she is a keen businesswoman, and much like many designers that do sell their label, she knew that it was time to bow out, leaving space for a new creative director. The company found the new replacement in Francesco Rizzo, and at the time not widely known designer who was part of the design team at Prada, who you may remember Marnie was compared to in their early days. Rizzo's first collection for the brand was Autumn Winter 17, and it was a great introduction to Rizzo as a designer. Yes, he kept the Marnie codes like that jacket, the vibrant print, and the classic Marnie jewellery, which debuted in 2003, sorry for not mentioning that before, as well as reintroducing fur, this time as faux fur. The collection was not without notable changes. In recent years, Consuelo had become more likely to colour block in her collections and hadn't done extreme prints in a while. Rizzo did include and start with color blocking, but towards the end of the show brought fun prints back in his own unique way that read as more youthful than ever before. It was clear to anyone interested in Marnie that a new era had begun for the brand, and it was going to get exciting. Show after show, those that knew Marnie could see how great the design was. Some of my personal favourites were interestingly both in the one year that Stefano Biondo was CEO, and they were the men's wear Spring Summer 19 and the women's wear Spring Summer 20, just because of the colours and prints really resonating with me. But even with the critical success, Marni was still a bit of an underdog in comparison to who they were competing with, namely Mew Mew and Prada, who were still the most similar in product offering to Marni. I really think that if Marni had continued in this way, it would have remained an insider industry favourite, but never reaching out to a wider audience, just simply because of the shadow that Mucha casted. But the world had other plans, and so when the world plummeted into the coronavirus pandemic, something at Marni changed, and it changed quickly. This 2021 resort lookbook was the first taste that we as an audience got for this new perspective. But nothing could prepare me for the reveal that was their Spring Summer 21 Marnie Festo collection. The video lasts over an hour in this kind of cryptic CCTV themed video that was streamed live for Milan Fashion Week. The collection itself was interesting and artistic, an extension of Rizzo's creative vision of hand painting and playful imagery that clearly was inspired from the interior design choices that he made during lockdown, as he explains in this Vogue video. This collection is really the start of Rizzo putting more of himself into the designs at Marnie, and a couple of the house codes are either transformed or reduced, but clearly it was successful because the following collection, Autumn Winter 21, is where this new aesthetic kicked into high 
gear. This collection is probably my favorite Marnie collection ever, which is saying a lot because I have been a fan of Marnie for over a decade at this point. I just adore the more creative way that Rizzo has now taken the brand. I of course enjoyed his work before, I don't think he has ever had a weak collection with Marnie, but having shown how he could combine Marnie's codes with his own from the early collections gave him credence to play more with the brand towards his own aesthetic without alienating the Marnie customer. This is mostly done with these silhouettes that he brings, most of which are really fresh and dynamic that push the idea of clothing as a concept, while also using a significant amount of hand painting, which we've seen a few times from Rizzo before. And I also think that it's interesting that he preempts the large bag trend that we're seeing now, all the way back in 2020 during the pandemic. Autumn winter 2021 is heightened luxury creativeness that was shown also through three videos that the brand released, with each one representing a different meal time filmed in Rizzo's own house that I showed you briefly before in the Vogue video. But the pandemic was coming to a more normalized point, and now people were curious how Marnie having evolved so much during the lockdown would continue on this upward streak. The Spring Summer 22 collection significantly surpassed this expectation. Not only the models, but also the audience were donned in hand-painted Marnie clothes in an expression of authenticity that was completely unmatched. The paintings this time were florals, which are basically a staple of Marnie now at this point, as well as stripes. But more interestingly, in my opinion, were the silhouettes that they were creating. Once again, Rizzo completely subverts the traditional silhouetting that one would come to expect into these incredibly dynamic shapes, which are just beautiful especially in the men's we're offering, as this kind of playfulness is seldom experienced for men with these older, larger luxury houses. Really, the only complaint I have about this collection is that the clothes that we see on the catwalk just didn't match what actually came into stores. I'm aware that that is common in the industry, and obviously it would be difficult, if not impossible, for them to produce hand-painted garments for all of their 370 stores, but I would have been happy with a few more of the exciting garments actually being made for sale more widely. Of course, I do understand that Marnie is a business and commerciality is super important, without which we wouldn't even see Rizzo's genius on the catwalk, so I'll take what I can get. The following collection, Autumn Winter 22, was played down in comparison as well. I did really enjoy this collection, even if it wasn't the most creative, a sentiment it seems that a couple of the online reviewers had in a sea of extremely good reviews that herald the balancing of creative and commercial pieces, though I don't think it was his fault for this reduction in creativity. And instead, I think it adds credence to his skill as a designer to be able to adapt to commerciality this well when needed, while still including the creativity in the presentation, which began in this darkly lit room, but as the guests began to leave, they were met outside for a sunbathed feast. However, even though I just complained about it, this adaption to commerciality was exceptionally well-timed because it was just a few months later that the viral Marnie Uniqlo collab debuted. This collection really hit on TikTok, with several respected fashion commentators making videos on the collection to high praise, most of which men who were seemingly most interested in the patterns and prints that were on offer, a stark contrast to the vast majority of men's weathers on the market currently, especially in this high street setting where navy, beige and black seem to be the only thing available. Having all the prints and colours widely available was undoubtedly strategic for this reason. It contrasted with the other clothes on display, bringing attention to the collab and thereby Marnie as a brand, while also introducing many to what Marnie had most to offer, colour and print. The prints were largely designed to look like hand paintings, which is something I suggested that the main line do more of earlier, with this being a great example of how commercially successful it could be in stores and potentially act as their differentiator to the other big name, long-standing luxury brands, and even as a differentiator to their direct competitor in Prada. For this reason, primarily, the collection was a phenomenal success, not only for its great sales, but also because it hit a new demographic of consumers that were unlikely to have heard of Marnie prior to this, which meant a huge increase of expectation for the Marnie brand coming into their Spring Summer 23 show. Expectations that they were ready to meet head-on with their debut New York show. Following the increase of youth as a market for Marnie due to the Uniqlo collab, this move was so incredibly clever. Previously showing in Milan, and as far as I'm aware they've never shown anywhere else, 
but Milan's demographic tends to be a tad more reserved, potentially a little older, especially for menswear, than the youthful energy that New York brings. Inspired by the everlasting sun, the collection developed on disheveled knitwear and interesting silhouettes through drunken knits, hand-painted circles, and other shapes from the artist Flamina Veronesi, crop tops, circular cutouts, and over and under sized pieces. It seems that Marnie have been rebranding themselves towards this new vision Risso introduced in the 2021 resort lookback that we discussed before. They've learned that it resonates with the young and now they're just in the process of adjusting their target market accordingly not only in this new fashion week, but also in their product offering. The new Y2K look mixed with this acidic color palette volleyed exceptionally hard towards Gen Z. Though this direction for the brand seemed a bit like fluke at first with the freedom that the pandemic brought Grizzo, the decision to go towards the noise instead of running from it is really clever as a business plan, hopefully making for lifelong loyal customers from these newly interested fan bases. Rizzo is such an interesting designer to watch, and I'm so happy that he's been able to flourish so much within the Marnie brand, whom he clearly has exceptional synergy with. I'm so happy to see this new era, and I hope that he continues for many years at this, because I can only imagine the growth that he will bring to Marnie. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this one, or check out some of my other videos now.